Well, a hearty shalom to you, Jeffrey Seif here, and uh, let me tell you, I'm glad you're there. Never mind who's here, you're there, and it testifies to your own interest in the scripture, and kudos to you for that. I want you to know it'll pay dividends. We're looking this week at Parashat Vayishlach, and it comes from uh, Genesis 32.4, then Jacob sent messengers. You know, we speak of apostles today. Uh, uh, Messianic Jews like to speak of shaliach. Uh, from emissaries, uh, sent ones, if you will. Well, uh, Jacob sent messengers of form. It's a fascinating story, pinging up in chapter 32. It gets rather mystical, too. Uh, uh, my wife, Barry, Dr. Barry, God bless, is doing a, a talk uh, in Sabbath in, 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 in a couple of days on this very um, portion. She's interested in um, the story of uh, Jacob wrestling with God or wrestling with an angel, a messenger, and we'll look at that in brief. But what I want you to see with me here as we go on a journey with Jacob is sometimes life's journey is rather dry. Other times it, it, it's characterized by supernatural encounters. I mentioned that because at the very end of last week, uh, uh, the beginning of chapter 32, we're told uh, Jacob uh, that angels were all about that interestingly in 32 2 Jacob left on his way and the angels of God met him then Jacob said when he saw them this is God's camp and he named it as such he he, he noticed special um, divine messengers if you will and then he goes on a journey uh, back to Israel he was up in Padan Aram Syria and he heads back to Canaan and there is he about as he's about to enter into this next phase, this land of destiny, all of a sudden he's wrestling all night uh, with God, wrestling with an angel of God. Fascinating story uh, at a variety of levels. Well, what happens, as you probably know, is he fled Esau years prior, but now he's got to come back home and it's time to face the music. Uh, it's been, uh, you know, 20 plus years and uh, he knows Esau's nature. It didn't leave on very good terms but now he's gonna go back and face the music or face the musician. He doesn't know what he's gonna get. And uh, his stomach's churning a little bit. This is the story this week where realizing that 400 are coming and Esau's greeting party, armed men at that, he separates his camp, he sends gifts, he's trying to do everything he can to be very prudent. He doesn't know what he's gonna expect. And with Esau, he can expect anything well just before he meets him in chapter 32 verses 25 through the end of the chapter Jacob is up all night alone by himself sent everybody ahead of him and now he's there wrestling with God I'll tell you the problem I have with this it says he wrestled with God all night and you know you know and then at the end you know it was like a tie and Jacob walks away with his uh, thigh you know, bust it up a little bit so he's limping afterward. Now there's a few things. Number one, if you're going to wrestle with God, I don't think you're going to win. Personally, creator of the universe, mortal man, it's like an ant wrestling with a human being. I don't think the ant has much of a chance to tell you the truth. Number one. Number two, if you're going to wrestle, how do you wrestle all night? I don't know if there's any athletes listening, but, you know, you, when people get into wrestling, they spend their energy in a kind of or two or three if they're in good shape. Never mind all night. Now, I don't know, are we talking about literally here? I think we have to think in those terms, or I think we should read literature literally. But I'll tell you, I look at it more as an analogy, quite frankly, at least the takeaway lesson for me is sometimes when we're really in the throes of challenge or up against the edge, it's not at all uncommon for someone to, you know, be up late at night, musing, having trouble going to sleep, wrestling, with the realities and the circumstances and then coming out of it. Uh, I mean, I see that. But I don't want to just collapse this into a normal kind of person dealing with anxiety. What's interesting here is sometimes when we transition in life, or at least in, in a walk with God, uh, to get from one level then on to the next, uh, sometimes we do have these supernatural encounters with God. We just do. It doesn't happen every day. You know, some preachers, you know, every message, and the Lord told me, and the Lord showed me, and the Lord said, and I heard. I don't know that, I mean, I mean, listen, for me, God doesn't do all that much talking, to tell you the truth. I mean, there are those moments when, you know, these, these you get a word, if you will. 
uh, similarly here, God doesn't show up in, with miracles and blessings every step of the way, every day in these patriarchs' lives. But this is one of those precious moments. The text says that as Jacob's leaving Syria and heading back to Canaan, there's angels up there. And then when he heads into Canaan, he wrestles with the Lord, uh, with a, an angel of the Lord, a messenger of the Lord. There are those moments uh, when that happens. And you know what? It, it may happen with you. In any case, chapter 33, happily for, for Jacob, he meets Esau, and Esau's uh, reasonably kindly disposed toward him. And, but of course, bringing a lot of gifts <laughs> probably helps matters a little bit. You know, we should learn to give gifts. Now, I realize it's a holiday season, and there's nothing like a gift, but I'm telling you, uh, it's more blessed to give than to receive, if you will. Uh, be a gift giver. You'll see, honestly, I mean, this really is an aside, but you'll really see it pays dividends. But, you know, why believe me? Just read chapter 32 and chapter 33, and you'll see that for yourself. Well, um, never mind a story where things are working out reasonably well for Jacob. You know, out of the frying pan into the fire. In chapter 34, he faces a circumstance here where he settles in the land. Esau has gone away, and... Uh, one of the princes of the land is kindly disposed toward one of Jacob's daughters. And there's a little hanky-panky. And uh, the brothers hear of it, and they're fit to be tied. The, uh, the family wants to make good. It looks like the young man is really genuinely kindly disposed toward Dina, wants to make it right. And Jacob uh, comes to terms with the young man and the young man's family to set up a wedding and what have you. But the brothers get in the middle of that and effect a slaughter. Uh, Jacob is really chagrined by that, and, and who wouldn't be to tell you the truth? That uh, First of all, he's made an agreement as the male, as the leader of the family. You know, sometimes you just have to make the best of a bad situation. Uh, the young man and Dina, it, it, it got out of hand. I don't want to make light of a molestation. I really don't. Uh, this thing got out of hand, but there might have been some chemistry between them, and uh, you know, the text just doesn't say, but it does say that the man, the young man loved her. And it does say that he and the family wanted to make it right. And it does say that Jacob opted to make it right with them, settle for a wedding. But the brothers, through intrigue, wouldn't have it and went and killed the family and more. Not a good situation. In part because, A, it's not following the lead of the father in this case. Uh, but, B, as per the lament that Jacob's going to give voice to, the upshot is it'll make him onerous, odious to those in the land. All of a sudden, here's a clan that's just making their way back into Canaan after all these years, a clan of killers that wiped out another family like that. It just uh, makes things difficult. But, you know, sometimes it's, um, you know, life is like a poker game. We have to deal with whatever cards we're dealt, and they're not always desirable. But God saves, you know. I mean, he, uh, you know, Jacob is, my God, what have you guys gotten me into? That's what he says to his sons. Uh, but they get on with it. They move on. And in chapter 35, it's really interesting. Uh, as we follow Jacob in his journeys, he goes back to Bethel. He'd been there before on the way out. But there, you know, he has a very special moment uh, in verse 9. God appears to Jacob again after he turned from a Danaram and he blessed him. And God said to him, your name was Jacob. No longer will name be Jacob. Your name will be Israel, the famous name change that abides in, in perpetuity, does it not? It's interesting, there's a prophetic word that carries on from there, subsequent to which Rachel dies in childbirth. It's amazing, you have these high moments where God shows up with the private word, and then all of a sudden the woman that you love dies in childbirth, and the child is born Benjamin, Benjamin, and, uh, and then... Uh, uh, subsequent to this narrative, then in the 36th chapter, all the way to the end, uh, we hear about Esau. You know, Esau is uh, kind of looked at, uh, you know, disparagingly. Uh, and uh, there are things that, well, what can I say? He's one of Jacob's children, and he has blessings upon him too as such. And uh, it, it has a rather lengthy registry here of the, the, his children and what becomes of them and how they move off east then to Edom in what would be today's Jordan, geographically anyways. 
well, what do I want to do with this, if anything? I want you to look with me, please, in chapter 35, and I want to read a couple verses and speak to it. Your name was Jacob, says God. No longer will your name be Jacob, for your name will be Israel. So he named him Israel. It's interesting that uh, you get a new name. God also said to him, I am El Shaddai, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and an assembly of nations will come from you. From your loins will come forth kings. The land that I gave to Abraham and to Isaac, I give it to you. And to your seed after you, I will give the land. And then there's a discussion here about Esau. Now listen, let me just close on this note, if you will. It's, it's spiritual, it's religious, it's political as well. I don't know how people can read the Bible and not see that the land of Israel belongs to the descendants of Israel. <laughs> You know, I bet you that people debate today, well, whose land is it? You know, the Palestinians give claim to it. You know, a Bible reader is just forced to the conclusion that uh, that God gave a particular parcel of land to a particular people, and he gave it to them in perpetuity. And that is made abundantly clear, not just here, but elsewhere in the text. Now, the fact today you can have these conferences, these Christians that disavow that, they just don't take the Bible they don't take the literature literally. They do not take the literature seriously. Here, God is very clear. He gives a word to him about his destiny. Before I let you go, listen, as you make your way through your own seasons in life, which are sometimes troubled, don't give up on an expectation that as you seek God, God will meet you there and give you a word and let you know the outcome of your own life and circumstance. Well, a few minutes with Scythe working through a Tree of Life version of the Bible. Usually I big out the big brick, but here I have the small, thin light edition of the Tree of Life version. Thank you so much for going with me on the journey. If you don't have one of these versions of the Bible, pick it up. May the Lord bless you and keep you, and may he make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. God bless.